Niña, yo recuerdo la pena y el dolor Y este sentimiento de duda y de rencor Bella, ya tú sabes, me quiero redimir Tú tienes la llave que calma mi sufrir Y tú te vas, tú te vas Uh, and the third thing I'd like to do before uh, Professor Adelaida Solis of her very own university in Bogota uh, begins her presentation is to introduce very briefly uh, the ambassador of Colombia, uh, Mr. His Excellency Mr. Diego Bellinger. Uh, the Professor Solis was brought to Australia uh, as a result of uh, funding from the Embassy of Colombia in Australia. And we're very, very glad to have him here and very much uh, uh, glad of the support of the Government of Columbia and the Embassy of Columbia. So if I could turn over for a few minutes to the Ambassador. Thank you, Professor Means. I will go through reading all this, don't worry, because the <laughs> keynote speaker is Professor Surtis. I want just to say uh, to thank the ambassadors of Latin America we are celebrating 200 years of independence in uh, five of our countries. Uh, and we are very uh, delighted to uh, and thanks, uh, thanking a lot to Anklas and Ailasa for the invitation to Professor Sulis. Uh, I see the ambassador of Argentina and Uruguay and Ecuador and Venezuela. And so uh, very shortly, uh, this is a presentation from Professor Sidney, the, sorry, from Professor Surdis. She is a magister in social research. She is historian from the University of Javeriana. But the most important that I wanted to highlight before uh, Professor Fernanda Peñalosa uh, introduces the details of uh, Professor Surdis' works, I want to highlight briefly that Professor Surtis, uh, who is uh, born in Cartagena, Colombia, is a member of the Colombian History uh, Academy, number uh, 20 C. She is a member of the General Archive of, of Colombia. She is a member, corresponding member, of the uh, Academy of History of Cartagena. She, too, is a member of the uh, History Academy of Bogota, capital of Colombia. Uh, the same, she is a um, corresponding member of the Academy Royal, Royal Academy of History of Spain, also of, uh, of San Salvador and of Ecuador. So I think with these uh, distinctions, Professor uh, can delight us with the uh, interesting facts about Colombian independence. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fernanda Peñarosa. I'm a lecturer of Latin American Studies in the University of Sydney. And I was given the honor to introduce Professor Adelaida Sudis. My words are going to be very brief because um, I know that we're all looking forward to the to the paper, and there have been already three people speaking, so I'm sure that um, you want me to be as brief as possible. Many of the distinguished um, characteristics of um, Professor Solis's career have been mentioned by the ambassador. So I would like uh, just to mention some of her publications, which will give you a sense of the, um, the type of uh, work that um, Professor Solis, as a historian, has been developing. Um, they are in Spanish because I haven't had the time to translate them, but I'm sure for those of you who um, are not necessarily um, English, uh, Spanish speakers will understand. So, amongst her publications are um, El Precio de la Independencia, La Población de Cartagena de Indias, 1814-1816, Ruptura del Estado Colonial y Tránsito hacia la República, Historia Económica y Social del Caribe Colombiano. A Proceso de Independencia del Caribe Colombiano, and the most recent publication of 2009 is El Nuevo Reino y sus Provincias, Crisis de la Independencia y Experiencias Republicanas. 
Um, as the list that I just, uh, you know, sort of condensed it very briefly suggests, she's the most knowledgeable speaker, I think, for the Atlanta main conference theme when it comes to the experience of um, independence in Colombia. So it is um, really an incredibly um, suitable, more than suitable speaker for this particular um, conference. Um, in particular because her, um, her publications challenge many tradition, traditional views on the independence process. Um, another groundbreaking contribution that sort of uh, illustrates um, this is that um, she has worked on a previously neglected topic, which is the separately Jews in Colombia and the role in the independence movement. Um, before uh, Professor Solis starts reading her work, um, I would like, the, does this still have the puzzling um, title of um, Independence in the Colombian Caribbean, the History of Magical Realism? Is that still the title? Before she starts with this presentation, I would like to make some brief reflections on the significance of her talk in this conference. I was very pleased when I saw the conference programs to see that there is you know, a keynote um, speaker, uh, a keynote lecture wholly devoted to Colombia. Because unfortunately, in some courses, syllabus, in conferences, and even in publications, particularly in the English uh, speaking world, there are trends that inevitably reproduce um, some stereotypes. So certain countries are inextricably linked with um, specific topics, or they are fairly absent. The case of Colombia is peculiar in the sense that sometimes it's completely left out, or when included, it is mostly in relation to its wonderful literature. The figure of Gabriel Garcia Marquez is very um, known to all of us, or its political conflicts with the drug uh, trafficking. Um, so, when I was, um, uh, for example, very recently I was invited to give um, a talk in a conference of Spanish-speaking network and a Colombian lady said everything you said was very interesting but you didn't mention Colombia. And I think this anecdote sort of reflects how uh, many people perceive how you know, Latin American studies sometimes fail to um, really dwell on the richness of Colombian history and all the opportunities that opens up in terms of methodologies, theories and cultural, uh, historical, social, and political issues. And the second and final reflection um, I would like to share with you is that when the Colombian ambassador introduced me to Professor Sudis, um, you know, I, I approach her, and I, as I always do with, uh, when I have to present the speakers, and I ask her, would you like me to highlight a specific achievement of your illustrious career? And she said to me, um, no, no se preocupe, es un honor para mí que usted siendo de la Universidad de Sydney me presente. Um, so I think that speaks volumes of, um, of her um, modesty. And the, the other thing that I would like to say is that for a woman who has you know, managed to build up a career in Colombia, um, and she has this prestigious um, position in the, you know, the, the Academy of History in Colombia, and yet has remained humble. I think she is truly an inspiration. I was thinking of the, the, the words of Arturo Arias in relation to the responsibility of us as individuals to sort of foster careers that um, help to, to, um, to, to establish links between our, um, our academic life and, um, and those values that we hold so dearly. So, um, she's an example, I think, to follow for academics in Colombia and elsewhere, and particularly uh, an era where collegiality is discouraged by a highly competitive market um, that seems incompatible with the genuine and humble gestures like that of Professor Sudis. So, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Professor Mines, President of AMBASA, Mr. Ambassador, our dear Ambassador, Maria Fernanda Peñalosa. She moved me with her, uh, with her beautiful words about me, uh, members of the faculty, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, students um, of uh, this and other universities. 
I'm very pleased and very glad to be here with you. And as Maria Fernanda said, well, it's an honor for me to be able to um, uh, share with you some of my, um, my research and my knowledge about um, our Colombian and Latin American history. Thank you. Uh, I am going to show you first some maps because I think it's important that everyone uh, locates perfectly geographically where is Colombia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, after the words you said, that, that's the least I can, I can, I can say. But uh, well, it's normal. I mean, we are in the other side of the of the of the world. So I'm going first to um, uh, locate some some maps. These are the Spanish vice royalties. The Spanish vice royalty. Over here we have the vice royalty of New Spain, which is to say Mexico. These were the 13 American colonies. All of this was uh, was uh, Spanish. Here is the other great vice royalty, the vice royalty of Peru. This is um, uh, end of the 18th century. Over here is the third vice royalty created uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 18th century, 1739, uh, uh, the vice royalty of New Granada, which, as you see, goes from the Pacific coast to this Atlantic coast, and Venezuela, the captaincy of Venezuela, which only lasted under the vice royalty of New Granada a couple of years before it was created as captain general, uh, as a captaincy uh, different from the vice royalty. And over here we have the last vice royalty created at the end of the 17th, 18th century, vice royalty of La Plata, Rio de la Plata, which is today uh, Argentina um, and Chile. And over here, this was part of the vice royalty of Peru then, a part of the vice royalty of Rio de la Plata when it was created, but this, the audience of Charcas is where Simón Bolívar created the actual country of Bolivia. Now, this is the, the actual map of Colombia. As you see, we are the only country in South America with coasts on the Pacific Ocean and on the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean Sea. I am going to talk to you about this region which I am just showing here. That, uh, account, uh, that takes all the, all the Caribbean, the Atlantic coast uh, of Colombia. Over here you see a map where how that Caribbean region is divided today, is politically divided today. We, uh, the, our country divided in what we call uh, departments is um, equivalent to the states here in, in, in Australia. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight different states which are all the Caribbean region of Colombia. Independence in the Colombian Caribbean, the history of magic realism. I suppose many of you are wondering why on earth this title? What has this to do with Garcia Marquez's novels? Well, um, 100 Years of Solitude 
is a novel. I am not talking as one that knows a lot of literature. I'm just a Colombian historian. Um, Garcia Marquez novels uh, pictures how certain family and a certain uh, place suffered a hundred years of solitude. Well, that's a, a magnificent, um, a, a magnificent uh, imagination. But uh, as one of his um, of his friends told him once, you are not really a storyteller. You are much more a notary. Why? Because such things happen in the Caribbean. And we have the, the, in the history of the Caribbean, the Caribbean suffered after independence because of all the destruction it suffered. It suffered a hundred years of solitude. The region um, uh, underwent a terrible downfall and destruction and only started to recover uh, from the, the hardships and the destruction of the independence war a hundred years later. So there we have a hundred years of solitude. I am quite sure Garcia Marquez, who lives in Cartagena, uh, has a house in Cartagena, was very well aware of this situation which he pictures part of it in his, in his famous novel. Right. The, the independence process that took place between 1810 and 1824 was a violent political rupture of the bonds which linked Spanish America and in our case the Viceroyalty of New Granada with Spain. New Granada is Colombia today. Its history can be traced back to the second half of the 18th century, during which very significant and economic changes took place, especially through the teachings of the botanical expedition led by sage Jose Celestino Mutis, which formed a generation of illustrated, ambitious, and brave patriots who brought about emancipation. In the first decade of the 19th century, the liberal and autonomist ideas already inspired in the criollos by the Spanish illustration, the French encyclopedia, and the revolution of the English colonies were popular among the Grenadine leaders who summoned themselves to the revolt of the metropolis against Napoleon Bonaparte in order to preserve the Spanish empire under its legitimate monarch. It's important uh, to show um, uh, this, um, this, this um, part of history because right now we are looking in, in Colombia and in the rest of Latin America, we are envisaging the independence as a process that took place in all America, not just in, in one um, country or in two different countries, but it was um, a process that took place in the continent that belong uh, to Spain and that it started in Spain. Independence started, started in Spain, um, even if it, sounds, um, if it sounds peculiar. Why? Because Napoleon invaded Spain in 1808. I am not going to go in that part of history. Very probably where, uh, you've, uh, you've heard uh, uh, about it in other lectures. Invaded Spain and imprisoned the, the king of Spain, imprisoned the king of Spain, who was uh, forced to uh, resign his crown uh, in Napoleon's brother, Jose Bonaparte. This caused the guerrilla wars and the revolution in Spain to... Thank you. Um, in order to, uh, uh, to explain the French, the invaders and to save the empire for the legitimate, uh, the legitimate king. So it started in Spain in, in 1808. And what happens in America? In America, the same process took place. The first um, the first uh, in the stage of independence or, pre uh, or, or stage of pre-independence took place when um, the American uh, kingdoms 
at that moment called colonies, uh, uh, the American kingdoms decided that they would, um, they were Spanish. That was the, the other Spain, the Spain uh, overseas, um, decided to protect and uh, themselves against the French. So at the beginning, the, the idea was that um, all the empire was Spanish and was going to continue Spanish and was going to oppose Napoleon. Was going to oppose Napoleon. That's why today in the American countries we study the independence with that, um, uh, uh, with that uh, point of view. It started in Spain, we were part of Spain, we considered ourselves Spaniards and as Spaniards had to defend the kingdom against Napoleon and it was the uh, American, um, the, the, the gold from New Granada and the silver from Peru and the silver from Mexico that went to Spain in order to support the Spanish troops against Napoleon and the Spanish revolution against Napoleon. So, as I was saying, two stages, uh, two places. This first stage, which I'm talking about, uh, started in 1810, ended in 1816. In 1816 comes a period of uh, reconquering uh, the colonies for Spain. We will we'll get uh, there uh, later. And the second uh, stage of independence is from 1807 to 1821, when Simón Bolívar um, uh, re, uh, be, uh, starts the, the wars the, of independence. During this first stage, what happened? The people, the criollos, really, uh, the criollos uh, take power again, they uh, take power in the name of the king, and they organize supreme boards of government. The Supreme Boards of Government started in Spain with the Supreme Board in Seville um, and in America, uh, Supreme Boards, just like the Board in Seville, assumed power because of the vacancy of the throne and um, the non-recognition non of José Bonaparte as the King of Spain. Now, this um, assumption of power uh, was important because for the, um, actually, um, it's, it's been uh, investigated and we realize that uh, the people in New Granada, the Criollos, in the, in the, in the major schools uh, of El Rosario and San Bartolomé in New Granada were prepared to take over and were prepared to understand the politics uh, of the French Revolution, why? Because they had studied uh, those those um, those politics and that philosophy under the Spanish scholasticism of Francisco Suarez, which taught. That's why the Jesuits were expelled um, from from Spain and all its domains because they taught that um, sovereignty was for from uh, the, the people and it was the people, the community that gave sovereignty to one, uh, uh, one reigning family or, or one person so that it was legitimate to overthrow the tyrant and it was legitimate, legitimate um, to fight against tyranny. That was the reason why, the, uh, why, the, why in, in Bourbon, Spain, the Jesuits were expelled in, 16, uh, in 1763 by, by Charles III. So, when this situation comes, it was natural to assume sovereignty as the real uh, heirs of, um, of the people, and these supreme board, uh, boards begin to govern in the king's name. The first supreme board was organized in Cartagena, over there, in Cartagena, on May the 22nd, 1810. 
Its example was followed by the Criollos in Cali on July the 3rd, Pamplona on the 4th, and Santa Fe, the capital of the Viceroyalty, the 20th of July. Shortly afterwards, absolute emancipation took place in Cartagena. And now I am going to give you a brief um, look on Cartagena. This is the Caribbean, as you can see. This is all the Caribbean, the, 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 the Caribbean Sea. Here we have Mexico, here we have Central America, which was the captaincy of Guatemala, and here we have New Granada. Over here we have Cartagena. Now this triangle shows the defensive system of Spain in order to defend the great viceroyalties of Mexico, where came most of the silver, of Peru over here, where came also a, 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 the great treasure, the silver treasure, which went through the Panama Isthmus over here to Spain. Now, Cartagena was a stronghold, the most important stronghold in the southern Caribbean. Veracruz was another important stronghold, and here in Florida, we have St. Augustine, which was a fort, not as important as this one, but it uh, completed the triangle. Over here, in this line, we have Havana, which was protected by this, by this line. Now, the Spanish main, the Spanish main that everyone knows and talks about the pirates and the, and the uh, uh, and the treasures was a system of transportation by fleets, which you know that came from Spain. There were two fleets. This one that came over here down to Cartagena, and this one that came this way to Veracruz. This fleet that arrived Cartagena carried back to Spain, carried back to Spain this way the treasures from Peru and the gold from New Granada. And this one here, from Veracruz, carried to Spain the treasures, the, the, the treasures of, um, of New Spain, that is to say of Mexico. It came this way, stopped here in La Habana, and here it goes to Spain. So as you see, Cartagena's strategic position was very, very important. At, at that time, Cartagena was um, a, a, very, um, a very important place for the defensive of the empire, for the defense of the empire in the Caribbean. It had to take care of the Isthmus of Panama. That's why Panama was uh, Colombian uh, until 19, 1903. So, um, as you see, it was the second city in the vice royalty because the capital city was high up in the mountains, uh, Bogotá. And although it was the second city, it was the richest and the most cosmopolitan place in the vice royalty because you know that commerce and, and, uh, uh, and news uh, come from, uh, from the sea first and Bogotá was high up in the mountains. Now, as I said, the first board was, the first government board was organized there in uh, May uh, 22nd, uh, 1810. However, a year later, as I said, these boards of government did not pretend total independence from Spain. They, uh, they were saving, the, they wanted autonomy, to manage their own political and to manage their own administrative and economic affairs, but they recognize Ferdinand VII as the king of the, the, 
of the, the two Spains, the peninsular Spain and the American Spain. They didn't want to break with the king, however, euphemistically, in Bogotá, the 20th of July, they said, well, yes, we do recognize Ferdinand VII, but he has to come and live here. That wasn't uh, so, so, uh, so strange. Why? Because that was exactly what, what the uh, Portuguese kings had done. Napoleon never uh, overtook the, the, the Portuguese state because they simply moved away to Brazil. Uh, the Spanish kings uh, didn't have time or didn't have the, the, the opportunity uh, to do so, so the Spanish uh, state did fall under Napoleon. A year later, on November 11, 18, uh, 1811, the walled city, Cartagena was a walled fortress, um, uh, declared total separation from Spain and created the free, sovereign, and independent state of Cartagena de Indias. This republic was the second free republic created in uh, in South America, the first one was Caracas, which lasted very little. Caracas was um, was created, I think, on, on July uh, 11, uh, 1811, and Cartagena on November 1811. But Caracas, uh, I'm not going to go into that part of history, but fell under uh, Spanish rule again very soon, uh, very soon afterwards. This Free Republic of Cartagena lived uh, uh, until December the 5th, 1815, when patriots evacuated the city, for they were unable to continue <coughs> resisting the Spanish armies commanded by General Pablo Morillo, sent by Ferdinand VII, to regain domain of the General Captaincy of Venezuela and the Vice Royalty of New Granada. I'm going to show you um, Two, uh, two maps uh, of the wall city of Cartagena. <laughs> the walls are all these, you know, in, in dark brown. This was part of the wall, but it was pulled down in the 20th century, around uh, 18, uh, 1926 or something, and it continues here. This is the, there were walls around here too. So at the end of the of the of the 18th century, uh, it was impossible to uh, defeat Cartagena um, with with arms. The only way to overtake the city, the only way to overtake the city was starving it. Uh, Cartagena had um, enough uh, water deposits and enough uh, food uh, deposits, if it was well provided, to upstand a siege of one year without having to uh, uh, receive uh, help from, from the outside. So, the only way to, to, to overtake the city, the only way was by starving it, which was exactly what happened. Spaniards had built the walls and Spaniards knew uh, that uh, it was impossible to, uh, to enter the city with arms, so they decided to starve the city and eventually it happened. Cartagena and this province endured a frightening siege. The province was invaded from Santa Marta. Santa Marta is the province nearby uh, at three different points, and the, sea, and the city was besieged by land and sea for 177 days. They invaded troops, halted the entry of food and reinforcement in order to make the plaza yield by hunger, which indeed eventually it happened. The price Cartagena paid for its independence was catastrophic, for as Garcia Marquez novel tells, it underwent a hundred years of solitude. 
It beheld the destruction of its economy, the sacrifice of its leader, the loss of, of its geopolitical position, and the impoverishment and economic recession for nearly a century. The, the destruction of the city meant a dramatic loss of population. Half of its inhabitants perished, dead during the siege, or sacrificed on the scaffolds of royal authorities. From 18,708 persons calculated for the city in 1815, the population decreased according to the 1835 census to 11,929 11, 11, persons and continued to demise during the whole 19th century. In 1905, the city of Cartagena was barely the home of 9,600 9, uh, persons. So you can see it lost uh, completely its population. That's why I say uh, uh, it suffered 100 years of solitude. Now, This is another map, this is an, an, an ancient map which shows uh, more or less uh, what I've shown you in the, in the map before. You see this one? That's the uh, San Felipe's uh, castle, the stronghold. That's the same, the same view from this part of the, of the modern city, you can see the, 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 the castle. Over here you see the fortresses of Boca Chica, which, um, which guarded one, um, the, the entry to the Cartagena Bay. And this is an old engraving uh, which shows how the city was in, um, in independence time. This part over here, you see all the walls around? This part over here was demolished and today we have a modern bridge that uh, connects the old part of the city with the new uh, part of the new city uh, the, today called Manga. All this was, was, uh, was demolished, but as you see, the city is completely surrounded by fortresses. The great castle I've just shown you was outside, more or less around here, in order to protect the city also. The Santa Marta province, which was the other province but that we saw in the map near uh, Cartagena, was well endowed by nature, but it was, however, very poor and scantily populated. The people took little interest in politics except for a small and wealthy elite uh, of families uh, related to families in Cartagena. Some criollos supported independence, but were quickly overpowered by royal officials that exceeded them in number and resources. The Indians, who were many, were loyal to the king. In Rio Acha, that is the Rio Acha Peninsula, the very, the very northern peninsula in, in Colombia, the Indians were loyal. And in Rio Acha, its leaders, mostly public employees, also defended the interest of Ferdinand VII. So you see, you have um, different uh, positions. Santa Marta became the last royalist bastion of the, um, of the, of, of the king, while Cartagena, well, Cartagena 
started uh, absolute independence. And Santa Marta remained remained loyal to Ferdinand VII until the last moment, which was in 1820. Now that I've given you a whole view, I want to talk about the first and the second stages of independence. Let me see how my time is going. The support and resistance for and against the independence process occurred in cities, actually small towns. The provinces were vast and sparsely populated plains, dense tropical rainforests, and isolated urban sites in the midst of difficult conditions dominated by the elements of nature. This is a characteristic of the Spanish colonization. The Spaniards um, replied, uh, the, the Spaniards uh, did uh, colonize uh, America using the same method they had done in the reconquest of the peninsula from the Moors. That, uh, from the, uh, that is, they would found cities and towns, and then from those cities and towns, they would expand and appropriate the surrounding territories. So it was communications were very difficult. Uh, towns and cities were uh, isolated. Uh, the, the, many of them never set out of their, of their own cities uh, to go other places because there were hardly any, any roads. I have a picture of what Cartagena's province and Santa Marta's province <coughs> uh, must have been, like they must have been uh, at the time of independence. So you see, to go from one place to another was, was very difficult. This is Cartagena today. The wall city is over here. It's only this little piece of, of lands and these islands. That was the only that was Cartagena in the uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. All this is the modern city. This didn't exist. This was just islands covered with rainforests and uh, well, um, lagoons and, uh, and rivers. So we are talking about this piece of land here. The rich and educated uh, criollos had learned the illustrated liberal ideas in the major colleges of El Rosario and San Bartolomé, as I already told you, and they had studied with José Celestino Mutis, the father of the illustration in New Granada. These criollos had access to news and information from abroad that arrived clandestinely to Cartagena in English, Dutch, and French ships. The city maintained legal and illegal trade with Jamaica and Curaçao, which favored the entry of books and other prohibited publications. In Cartagena and in Monpos, the second city of the, of the province, there were secret clubs and social gatherings where liberal ideas on autonom autonomy, right, uh, individual rights, uh, freedoms, and popular sovereignty were discussed as well as the news from Europe. As I told you, in Spain, in 1808, regular and guerrilla war broke up uh, then uh, throughout the country, and the authority was deposited in the Supreme Board of Government installed in Seville and later on installed in, uh, uh, in Cadiz. 
In 1810, in 1810, this uh, this uh, Supreme Board of Government of Spain resigned um, political power, and um, in a council of regency that was to govern in the name of uh, the imprisoned king, and it uh, this board of of uh, this uh, this regency council um, had residence in Cadiz and it pretended to rule over all America. That was when the uh, things started to, to break between, uh, relations started to, uh, to break between Spain and the colonies because the Regency didn't give enough representation to the American colonies in the courts of Spain that were to be held. The courts were a sort of parliament uh, where all the provinces of Spain were represented and while the provinces in the, in the, in the motherland uh, were uh, represented by, by one, two and sometimes uh, three persons per province, all the American uh, colonies had only 36 representatives. At that moment, um, the situation began uh, to uh, began to break between um, Spain, Peninsular Spain, and um, the Americas. In this play, in this moment, uh, takes place the. Um, absolute independence of Cartagena in 1811. And at that time, for America, Spain was lost. Spain was totally invaded by Napoleon and only the, um, the small island of Leon in the bay, in, in Cadiz Bay, was the only place free from the, uh, from the French so to America, uh, to America, Spain was lost, and the question arose: are, are we going to be French, or are we going to govern ourselves? And naturally, the idea of self-government and uh, uh, sovereignty and uh, authority and absolute authority rose, and that's when really the uh, absolute independence, the absolute separation from Spain began and it was a moment, it was a movement that um, took place in all the, in all the, uh, the Spanish Empire. The only, uh, some colonies, uh, or, or some, some colonies remained uh, faithful um, to Ferdinand VII but most of them declare absolute independence. And in our case, um, the Viceroyalty of New Granada with Panama, um, which was part of it, and, um, and the, the captaincy of Venezuela declared absolute independence. But what happens? Um, what happens uh, from that uh, moment on? Ferdinand VII is back on, on his throne. Napoleon is defeated and the Holy Alliance um, supports Ferdinand VII. He gets back his throne in Spain. We are talking about 18, um, 1814. Um, at the, the, the beginning, he pretends to comply with the situation in America. With the situation in America, Spain had uh, in, in 1812 the courts of Cadiz um, had drawn up a liberal constitution with a constitutional monarchy. And in that liberal constitution participated many American, um, many uh, delegates from, uh, from, the, from the colonies. When Ferdinand VII arrives to the throne again in 1814, he decides to um, take over and empower again um, his uh, well his absolute power. He abolishes the constitution 
and he draws up the largest military expedition ever drawn up in history against um, against uh, the captaincy of Venezuela and the Viceroyalty of New Granada. We are talking about uh, the end of 1814, beginning of 1815. In 18... Uh, in, the reconquest of the Viceroyalty, now an independent country, by the Expeditionary Army commanded by General Pablo Morillo, began with the occupation of Cartagena province and was carried out in three fronts. One organized from Santa Marta, we have told you that Santa Marta was completely uh, royalist, and by the governor and captain general of the kingdom that was, uh, that, that was governing from, from Santa Marta. The second by the expeditionary army which surrounded, that is the army that came from Spain, which surrounded the stronghold and this inland. And the third by the navy that blocked the city by sea. The site witnessed a hard, tough, merciless fight and lasted more than a year. So, the 5th of December, 1815, uh, Cartagena was starved. It had been enduring a siege of, uh, of 107 days. Uh, people had, uh, had to eat with all sorts of, uh, um, um, all sorts of animals, and uh, well, they ate uh, rats, uh, donkeys, uh, and, and um, yeah, they were dying in, in, in place in two years. The city uh, lost well half of, 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 its, uh, of its population. When the Spaniards entered, they only found desolation and misery, and uh, uh, the corpses were uh, too many all over, so that Morillo had to, uh, had to dump them at sea. It wasn't time nor, nor place to bury them, so they were just piled up in, in canoes and, uh, and dumped on sea. Horses, donkeys, dogs, leather, rats, and other vermin were consumed by a starving population that preferred death to surrender. To sur surrender. The 5th of December, 1815, at early dusk, patriots evacuated the city in privateer ships that, that were able to circumvent the siege of the Royal Army. Many shipwrecked, shipwrecked and others were abandoned by the pirates on Panamanian beaches after being robbed of their few belongings. On December the 6th, the king's troop entered the city where they only found desolation and death. After um, uh, the king's troop uh, under Morillo took uh, Cartagena, they went inland and by 1816, uh, the end of 1816, uh, the country was completely uh, submitted again to Spanish rule. And at this time is when we begin the second stage of independence. 1819 and 1821, Morillo takes over, a new viceroy is, is nominated. He was called uh, Juan de Samano, a military um, uh, uh, an old, an old, uh, an old general of the of the um, royal armies. Independent second stage, 1819-1821, directed by Simon Bolivar, the independence campaign to liberate the North Coast was launched in 1819. Bolivar invades New Granada invades New Granada from uh, the plains uh, in, in Venezuela. He crosses the Andes, he crosses the Andes in one of the campaigns that have been considered the most, um, I mean, uh, spectacular military, um, uh, military acts uh, in history, because I'm going to show you in the map where does he come from and the heights that he had to uh, climb in order to get to Bogotá.
Bolivar arrives from the anti indies and enters, he couldn't enter, he couldn't enter uh, um, uh, South America this way because this, one, uh, this was uh, all taken by the Spaniards and a stronghold of the royalists. So he comes in through the Orinoco River, through the Guayana uh, province. The Guayana province is around here. Here we have the lowlands of the uh, what we call uh, Llanos Orientales in the, uh, in the eastern part of Colombia. So he enters this way with his troops. He gets the troops um, that have been formed in, uh, in Venezuela by Paez, a man from the, uh, from the lowlands uh, of Venezuela. They are very uh, harsh, llaneros, cowboys, uh, I, uh, we, would say, we would say today, and very fierce and very savage in fighting. And he unites here with the troops that had been able to be saved of the First Republic, the one that fell under Morillo, by General Santander. Santander wasn't the general yet, but uh, he was a patriot that managed to get the uh, the remains of the of the of the armies and over here they were organized but they were really very poor armies uh, they were all peasants um, uh, cowboys they didn't have much uh, much clothing they didn't have uh, much arms and they were uh, really um, in very <coughs> difficult conditions nevertheless um, Bolivar manages to make an army out of them and he comes this way and climbs the Andes. This is the highest part over here we have Bogota. He climbs the Andes using an old cattle uh, uh, an old cattle um, way and he takes over in the Battle of Boyacá the, the Spaniards were completely uh, taken by surprise because they never thought that he could climb all these mountains. Bogotá is actually uh, 2,600 meters over sea level. And uh, these people, uh, had, uh, they were badly clothed, they uh, didn't have shoes, many of them died. The horses that came uh, from the plains uh, they were all lost because uh, they couldn't uh, they couldn't resist the heights. Uh, new horses had to had uh, had to be uh, taken on the way because the, the horses from the plains were not up to, to those heights and those temperatures. Neither um, uh, the the soldiers, many of them, uh, had uh, sorochi. That's uh, uh, something that uh, when people from lowlands have to go very high, uh, in, in very high altitude, uh, less, uh, lack of oxygen, lack of oxygen is, is due to, to uh, might kill them. So many of them uh, perished. Nevertheless, he managed uh, to get up to the to the high high mountains and. Uh, in a battle, the 7th of October, um, the 7th of August, the 7th of August, uh, uh, 19, 1819, uh, the head, the, the capital city of the vice royalty, that is Santa Fe de Bogota, was taken. However, the government, the Spanish government, didn't fall at that time because uh, uh, Viceroy Samano, fled once uh, Bogotá was, uh, once the battle was lost, uh, Samano and the uh, Real Audiencia, it is the High Court of, of Justice, and other uh, authorities fled to Cartagena, where they established government in 1819. In, in 1819, and um, what does he find, uh, what happens then in Cartagena? Um, while Bolívar is 
um, while Bolivar takes all these parts of the, of the country, I mean, slowly the independence goes upwards. By 18, here is Cartagena, by 1821, Cartagena is still under the Spanish rules and the Viceroy is in Cartagena, and the Viceroy is in Cartagena. But um, at that time, the Patriots did exactly the same thing that the Spaniards had done. They decided to yield the city by starving it, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, the city this time was surrounded by the Colombian troops. Colombia was already created. I'll talk a little bit of that uh, about that in in, in a few moments. Uh, the Colombian troops surrounded the city by land and a corsair army under uh, Admiral Brion, the Curaçao. Um, general that was fighting with the Colombian troops and Colombian um, a captain uh, Jose Padilla, they surrounded, they sieged the city by sea. So a moment came when the Spaniards had nothing to do, they were starving, just like Petrus had starved before, and they surrendered the city um, the 10th of October. 1921, and it was the surrender of the Spanish state to the Colombian state. Um, the Spanish uh, governor asked for, a, uh, for a, an honorable uh, surrender, and he, it, was, uh, it was granted to him so that the Spanish troops um, uh, left Colombia uh, with honor, and they left with their flags, their, uh, their swords, their uniforms. Um, it was a ceremony that took all day while um, they yielded the city fortress by fortress. And the documents say that um, while the Spanish flag was taken down, the Colombian flag was um, taken up. At the end of, of the day, they were embarked in Colombian ships that took them to Havana, and that was the end of the Spanish government in what today is Colombia. Just one, one word about, about Colombia. Bolívar created Colombia we call it Colombia la grande la gran Colombia we call it Colombia the great and I believe in Venezuela and in Ecuador the, the, the name, the name is, the, is the same why? because he created a new country a new country that comprised Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador right here. More or less this, this territory from the Orinoco, it was larger, it was, um, it was uh, created in, 17, um, in 1819 by the fundamental law of Colombia. This country um, continued but it was really a, a utopic idea because they were two different, the three territories, Ecuador, New Granada, and Venezuela. They had uh, um, communications were really uh, very, very difficult, and they had their own uh, administrative systems. They had uh, their own autonomy, so united in, in that moment, to be united in one large country with one capital city was really um, a, a beautiful uh, idea, but not, not for that time. The result was that well, strife um, uh, began in, in, the three, in the three countries, and by 1830, uh, the great Colombia was dissolved.
into Venezuela, New Granada, and Ecuador. About 1861, New Granada changed its name and uh, named its, uh, herself, named herself Colombia, which is the country that uh, we are talking of today. Thank you very much. <laughs>